circumstance. God wants to bless you. Whether you are overwhelmed with abundance or struggling in scarcity, God wants to bless you. Whether you are vocationally satisfied or still discovering your purpose, God wants to bless you. Whether you are holistic and healthy or spiritually sick, God wants to bless you and bless the world through you. God has called us on an adventure to receive and give his blessing. Will you step out and follow his lead? Will you join this journey to extravagant blessing? Well, good morning. Great to see all of you again. And how many like free stuff? You want something free? There you go. So this is the beginning of 21 days of prayer. We have a little free gift for you to remind you just to pray first. Pray before your day begins. Pray at the beginning of the year. Pray before you get in an argument, right? Pray before you go to work. And it's a little bracelet that says pray first, all right? So we're going to give everyone a bracelet. And I like to wear it during the 21 days. It just reminds me that, that we're in a focused prayer time. So they're coming around right now, and you can just have one. So a pray first bracelet. You know, if you're at a place where you can't wear the pray first, you know, on the outside, you can put it on the inside. I told the worship team, I said, if you're afraid, if you're ashamed of Jesus, you can turn it around. No, just kidding. Uh, but yeah, you might not be able to wear it, work or whatever, but you can just have this on uh, during, the, during the 21 days. I'll just have it on all the time just to remind me uh, that we are in a uh, intensive time of prayer. The series that we are going to be doing, we are not doing alone. We're doing it in conjunction with about 30 other churches. And it's a, around uh, the subject of a book that a friend of mine named Terry Smith uh, just wrote. Uh, he also wrote a wonderful book called The Hospitable Leader. But Terry Smith um, wrote a book that's a 28-day devotional kind of book called The Lord Bless You. And there are 28, it's, it's, it's designed for four weeks. There are readings every day. In fact, our 21 days of prayer as we're doing devotions every evening for the 21 days of prayer, we are going to be doing scriptures that are all around this area of blessing. I, I thought it was kind of ironic. We sang a song this morning that says, I'm not here for blessings, and we're starting a series called The Lord Bless You. Uh, so we're not here for blessings, but even though that's why we didn't come, how many are glad that God does bless us, amen? And that he's a God that's interested in blessing us, and he wants to bless us, and that's what this book is all about. So um, you can get those at Baker uh, uh, Bookhouse for $16.99, these books, but I pre-ordered some because I just had faith that some of you would want these books, and by pre-ordering, I was able to get them for 10 bucks. So if, if anybody wants one of these books, I have some available for $10, and I would encourage you to pick one up, use them. Uh, as a devotional as we're going through this time. Uh, also, during our 21 days of prayer, I have an idea that on Saturdays, after we have our opening devotion, if there are some of us that are going through this book together, that we'll sort of do a book club as part of our prayer time uh, on Saturday, so that after we do our de opening devotional, we can go in the lobby or we can go back in my office and we can, uh, we can discuss uh, what we've been learning in uh, in this book, the Lord bless you here, Melanie. So um, here we go, the Lord bless you. And the, uh, the 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 title of this particular week's message is God wants to bless you. And I think for some of you, you you kind of have to let that sit a little bit. And really decide whether you believe that or not, that, that it is God's desire to bless you. Could you turn to your neighbor and say, God's not mad at you? All right, all right. God really does want to bless you. Are you waiting for God to bless you? Are you looking for 
God's blessing, or are you waiting for the other shoe to drop? How many have ever used that, uh, that phrase? I might just be getting old using that, the other shoe to drop. You know, I was thinking about that phrase. I have no clue what that even means, you know. And so I looked it up. What does the other shoe dropping mean? And I discovered that in 19th century America, during the manufacturing era, in these tenement houses in New York City, people were just stacked up on top of each other with thin walls and thin floors. And, and a guy would get home late at night. He would get undressed. The people below his apartment would already be in bed, and they could hear him drop his shoes. And he would drop the first one and bother the people below him, and then he would realize, oh, yeah, there's people below me. And he'd lay the next one down softly. But the people below would be so irritated that they hadn't heard the second one drop that they would just say, would you go ahead and drop the other shoe so I can get to sleep? That's what it means for waiting. To, and it's become a euphemism for we're waiting for bad stuff to happen. Oh, well, what's the next bad thing that's going to happen? And uh, it, it can become part of our, um, just, just part of the way that we, we go about life. I, I talked to somebody that's from a particular country. He says, this is the way our whole country believes. Our whole country believes that life is a series of just bad events that we just try to get through. I mean, that's the way their whole culture thinks about life. And they have reason to because they've been through so many difficult things as a culture. We've just come through a time period in our history that was particularly scary during the, during the whole area, the COVID area, era. And, and I remember, especially at the beginning of that, just how we just didn't know what to do. Uh, you remember things like when you wash your hands, uh, uh, the Christian one I learned is say the Lord's Prayer. You know, that's how long you need to wash your hands, you know, that long while you're saying it. I, I was doing a Facebook Live uh, uh, during that era, I was out in my Uber car, and I, and I inadvertently touched my face, and people were counting, but don't touch your face, don't touch your face. You know, at that time, you know, it, we were worried about doorknobs. Remember that? You know, that, you know, if you didn't want to touch a doorknob, and, and that would be, uh, that, that could, you know, maybe spread the disease. And, and, and it was serious. We lost nearly 7 million people around the world through that disease. But imagine that in the, in the year 600, uh, in Europe, when the bubonic plague broke out, they lost between 25 and 50 million people. And you can imagine how, how scared that people were. And they believed that it was passed through sneezing. And, and, uh, and there was kind of a belief that was there at the time that when you sneezed, there was a particular moment there that you were left unprotected and that the devil could get in, like right after you sneezed, that the devil, you know, sneezed, and there was just that, that momentary thing where the devil could get in. And so Pope Gregory of the Great said on February 16, 600, he made a decree requiring Christians to use the phrase, God bless you. When someone sneezes, how many use that? You'll see atheists. God bless you, you know, if somebody, if somebody sneezes. It's just become so much part of the culture that when someone sneezes, we say, God bless you. And there, it, that is where it comes from. Odd as it may seem, bless you captures the heart of God for people in ways both large and small since the very beginning. It's been God's desire to bless us. In fact, God's first interaction with, with humans, it says in Genesis 1 that God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. The first thing that God did was the Bible says that God blessed them. And he said, be fruitful. That means have kids. You know that your kids, the Bible tells you, are a blessing. Amen. You know why kids are a blessing? Because they give you grandkids. All right. That's why kids are a blessing, right? No, kids are a blessing. Uh, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth 
and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky and the animals that scurry along the bread. This is the very first thing that God does. He wants Adam and Eve and you and me to know that it's his desire that together we are going to accomplish and do great things in the earth. God blessed them. But of course, if you know the story, humanity sneezed, didn't we? We call it the fall. And, and they made a choice not to do life God's way. They chose to, they chose to in the words of the, of the song, I did it my way, right? They, de- they, they, they decided that they were going to do it my way. And, and because of it, the curse came into being. And to be cursed means to live outside of God's full blessing. Remember, they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden and they were living somewhere east of Eden. In a way, you could say that all of human history since then has been the attempt to get back to that garden, to get back to Eden, but they were living east of Eden. Last Sunday, we cast a vision for the church and everything we talked about was was blessing. We talked about how God's going to bless us with beauty and diversity and children that know the Lord. We, we, we talked about this is going to be a place where people know God and find freedom and discover their purpose and make a difference. It was really a, a vision of blessing. Everything in history is a response to what happened in the first three chapters of Genesis. The world was designed and created by a loving God, and then we sneezed. And, uh, and, 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 you know, we didn't just acquire it by being a center, center but we were born with it. We were bo- the, the scripture says, I was born in sin, and I was shaped in iniquity. We, 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 we inherited, we became carriers of it from the very beginning. So there's three really important things that, that I want us to know at the beginning, at the outset of this series on blessing. Number one, God wanted in a relationship with men and women that he can bless and who will join him in his work, and he wants a world that looks and functions like Eden. If you don't believe me, read the, read the back of the book. God wants a world with that kind and that much blessing in it. Second thing we need to learn is in the fall, we learned how God allowed humanity to decide whether or not they wanted to live the life that God wanted, and they said no. It's kind of interesting. You can find churches that will kind of overbalance with one of either of these first two points. One is that God... God's desire is to bless you, and and the emphasis is that we were created in the image of God. And other churches you'll see that will totally emphasize this second second, uh, point, that we are totally and completely depraved. That we are just there, we're hopeless, there's, there's no good in us, there's, there's nothing. In fact, you know, we had, we had a song that we used to sing with a line, for such a worm as I. The worm theology, the, you know, that we are just, we are just so low down. So you got some people say, oh, we're creating the image. Others say, no, we're totally depraved. I really think that, that the truth is in the balance of those two, that, that it's both. It's both and. It's not either or. That we were created in the image of God, that we did fall. But even in that fall, there's still a spark of the divine in, 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 in the people that you see around you and the people that are lost, people that are away from God. I love that line from the princess bride, he's not dead, he's just mostly dead, right? <laughs> right. There, there's something that's still there. I don't know if you watched the, 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 the Buffalo Bills player that, that went down last week and it was horrifying. The, the game was canceled and he fell to his knees and died on the field. But thank God he wasn't just dead. He was mostly dead. He's back. Amen. He's back and he's breathing and he's communicating. And what a great story uh, that that's turning out to be. But the third point is that God, God said in, in the words of Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'll be back. After humanity fell, it was not God's desire that we would stay in that, in, in, that, in that state. Theologians call this the 
proto-evangel, that God said someday a man will come from this woman and undo the damage that has been done. Jesus did this through the death, the resurrection, and the exaltation uh, of Christ. Before humanity even fell sick, God had prepared the cure. Aren't you thankful for that? Scripture says about Jesus, he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Even before you messed up, he had the remedy. Thank God. The other part that I want us to know about this, though, the other really big idea is that God will have in the end what he wanted in the beginning, and he will accomplish this work through Jesus Christ. When you look at heaven, it looks a whole lot like Eden, right? In fact, the same tree that shows up in heaven is the same tree that was in the Garden of Eden. And interestingly enough, you're sitting in a church that celebrates that tree. It's the tree of life, right? The tree of life and and the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, it it had leaves that were for the healing of the nations. It had had fruit that gave uh, forth fruit. Every month there was a different kind of fruit. And in heaven, it's going to be the same way. So at Life Church, we talk about that. We, we talk about heaven. It's got the tree of life. We talk about how God created it. But at Life Church, we want to be a church that's in the process of helping people move back toward Eden. Amen. Amen. So that, that, so that life, that, and that word life and the tree of life, is an important symbol for us because Jesus The Bible says about the devil, he came to rob, kill, and destroy, but he came that you might have life and live it to the full. Amen. That God wants you to have a full life. Amen. Everything in history is about this journey back. Scripture ends with those who believe in Jesus and a renewed heaven and earth and the restoration of Eden. Uh, Revelation 22.3 says, No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. That's wonderful. Great start. Wonderful end. The obvious question is, what about now? What about now? If God wants that in the end, he began with blessing us. What about now? Because if we're honest about it, we still live in a world that is suffering from the sickness that started at the fall, amen? I don't know if you watch the news, but it's everywhere, isn't it? That the results of the fall are everywhere. So we live in this kingdom, this kingdom of God, that is one theologian, I like how he put it, it's already and it's not yet. So we already experience it, but we don't fully experience it, right? We don't experience it yet the way we're going to experience it when we get to heaven. But, it's, but already we get to have some of that heaven on earth. Amen. So God's going to have it in the end like it was in the beginning. Uh, so, so what about when Adam messed up, Jesus has put it back together. In Romans 5, 17 it says, For if by the trespasses of one man, that being Adam, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through that one man, Jesus Christ? Amen. Just like like Adam was our father in terms of our representative of our sinful nature, Jesus, who lived a sinful life, becomes our representative and, uh, and he is the cure, amen. <clears throat> so because of Jesus, the wounded God image in us is being healed. Because of Jesus, the world around us, <clears throat> the world we influence looks more like Eden and less like wilderness. That's our desire, that's our dream for Life Church, that we're gonna create some Eden around here, amen. That we're gonna create some atmosphere around here where people's lives can be changed and where the, the curse that's on their lives can be removed. There's a world of blessing that is ours now through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, 3 said, Blessed or blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us 
with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. Now, now everything that we call a blessing is not a blessing. A lot of times when we talk about blessings, we talk about a new car, right? How many know that new car is not a blessing if you can't pay for it, right? Amen. God blesses us not just with stuff, but God blesses us so that whether we're rich or whether we're poor, whether we have or whether we don't, whatever situation that we're in, we can, we can inside of us be blessed. Amen. We can take, we can take the weather with us. Amen. And that we can, we can be in this state of blessing. So in this series, um, uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to be uh, looking at that book, The Lord Bless You. Uh, hopefully some of you will be reading that over the next 21 uh, days, or tw- yeah, 28 days. Uh, our weekend services, the sermons over the next five weeks, will be sermons that talk about God's desire to bless us. Uh, also on Saturdays, we're going to have that book club uh, that, that we can discuss uh, aspects of, of the blessing in that. The reason that I'm excited about this is because some scholars believe that this is the whole theme of Scripture. That everything in the Bible is ultimately about the relationship that God wants to have and that God wants to restore blessing in our life. There are over 500 scriptures that speak of blessing. You remember the, the myth of King Midas, that everything that he, that he did turned to gold. The truth is God wants to bless us so that everything in our lives will not turn to gold, but it will turn to blessing. Amen. That, every, that, that, that blessing follows us. Uh, I love what Psalm 84, 6 says. When they walk through the valley of weeping, it will become a place of refreshing springs. The autumn rain will clothe it with blessings so that the people of God, even when we're going through valleys of weeping, he can turn it into a place of blessing. <clears throat> One example of many examples we could use are promises that God spoke through Moses as, as Moses led God's people to the promised land. Uh, he says this. He says, all these blessings will come upon you and accompany you. You're going to be blessed where you live. You're going to be blessed wherever you go. Your children are going to be blessed. Your businesses will be blessed. Your finances will be blessed. Your ministry will be blessed. You'll be blessed in everything you put your hands to. Even your enemies will see that you are blessed and reverence God and respect you. And the Lord will grant you abundant prosperity and open the heavens to bless all the work of your hands. Now, when I say prosperity, I'm not talking about the Lord's going to make you rich or all of those kinds of things. But the Bible talks about those that obey his commands. Your soul will prosper. Amen. Amen. So here's a couple insights that I want you to get from the Lord bless you. Number one, and this is a good definition, a working definition that we're going to be using in this series. To be blessed is to be in harmonious relationship with God who wants to do good in us to us, and through us. To be in a harmonious relationship with a God who wants to do good in us, he wants to do good to us, and he wants to do good through us. So to be blessed is to be in harmonious relationship with God. Romans 5.1 says it this way, since we have been made right with God by our faith, we have peace with God. Have you made peace with God? Have you come to that point where you're in a harmonious relationship? Are you still kicking against your creator? Or have you, have you made peace with God where you have that harmonious relationship? This happened through our Lord Jesus Christ who through our faith has brought us into that blessing of God's grace that we now enjoy. And we are happy because of the hope that we have of sharing God's glory. We have been made right with God. This being made right with God and having peace with God brings us into the blessing of of God's grace that we now enjoy, and we are happy. I want to say that that, that, that my friend who wrote this, he uses the word happy, and I'll be honest with you, I, I, I bristle a little bit against that word some because it depends on how you define happy, right? If you define happy as that, oh, I'm always happy. I'm always, you know, I'm just always have a smile on my face. How many know that Christians go through tough times, right? We go through. 
but, but there is an inner peace that we can have. We can have peace with God. We can have that shalom with God. We can have that, 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 that things are right with us and right with God, that even in the most difficult of circumstances, it's, you know, as I was reading this on Blessing, I'm also reading another book at the same time, and it's the book of Viktor Frankl and, and him sur- surviving the concentration camps uh, in Germany. And, and he's talking about how we have a choice and how we respond to different things. And, and, and amazingly, he was finding areas of blessing in a situation where he lost his mom and his dad, all his siblings except one sister in the concentration camps, and he was, he was persecuted greatly uh, for it and, and became a, a wonderful psychotherapist uh, in the aftermath of that. But he's really big on the fact that you are not a victim to your circumstances. You have a choice in the way that you respond. Even in the most difficult of search circumstances, we can be blessed. 1 Timothy 1.11 says, the glory of the blessed God or blissful God or happy God. I really think it's important. What is your image of God? Some of you grew up that God kind of looked like this, right? That, he, that he's, you ever see that game? You'll see it at, what do they call it, where the little gopher pumps and you're always yeah, whack-a-mole. God's kind of a whack-a-mole God. You know, he's just waiting for you to pop up so he can knock you down, you know. That's, that's not the image of God. I love this passage. About, about It's not up on the screen, but it says, it says that um, his anger is but for a moment, but his mercy is for a lifetime. That God's default, that God's default is to be a, a merciful God, that it's the God who created you. And, and he said to himself, what a wonderful world, right? Yeah, he, he, uh, he, he, he created a wonderful world. That's God's default, that, that the world that he made is beautiful. Amen. So it's not the kind of happiness we experience because good things happen to us. It's the joy that creates the condition for good things to happen. I can't help but think about this um, passage from Ezekiel that says, I will make a covenant of peace with them and rid the land of savage beasts so that they may live in the wilderness and sleep in the forest in safety. I will make them and the places surrounding my hill a blessing. I will send down showers and seasons. They will be showers of blessings. The trees will yield their fruit, and the ground will yield its crops, and the people will be secure in their land. They will know that I'm the Lord. Amen, that we bring the weather with us. You know, in prosperous countries, we look at rain as bad. You know why Tennessee is so beautiful? Rain. Amen. The reason we live in such a beautiful state. I know we woke up this morning on the way to church. It's raining. Thank God, amen? Thank God that rain just makes this place so gorgeous. There's a clip from the Truman Show I want to show you. Everywhere he went. Amen. The weather follows us. That the blessing of God uh, goes 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 with. We bring our weather with us. Amen. That, that's a great question. Are you a thermometer or are you a thermostat? A thermometer just reflects whatever the conditions are around them, right? Oh, it's a bad day. Oh, it's a good day. You know, be a thermostat, right? Bring the weather with you. Amen. 
good preaching. All right. To be blessed is to be in harmonious relationship with God who wants to do good in us. God wants to do good in us. Um, it, he's allowing the challenges of this fallen world, world in our fallenness to put us in circumstances where our character is being transformed even through difficult times, God is working all things for our good. Amen. Good things work for our good. Bad things work for our good. All things are working for our good. God wants to do good in us. James 1 says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Even when, even when you get the shingles, Pat, right? <laughs> That's not a laughing matter. I just went through a horrendous, horrendous case with that. But I, but I appreciated, I appreciated when I would talk to Pat, even through that, you could tell that, that, that never did he sense that God was not with him and all of that. Even, even when, when those things come, it's an opportunity for great joy. To be blessed is to be in a harmonious relationship with a God who wants to do good in us and to us. God loves to bless his kids. It's fun to bless our own kids. It's fun to bless our own grandkids. But just like you like to bless your children, God likes to bless you. Psalms 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and don't forget all his benefits. Amen. He heals our diseases. He redeems our life from destruction. He satisfies our mouth with good things so that our, I like this part, so that our youth is renewed like the eagles, right? That, that the blessings of God are there for us. Amen. I, can I just say publicly that one of the, the greatest blessings that God has ever given me is my wife, Melanie. I, I mean that with all my heart. I can't imagine doing life without her. I can't imagine doing ministry. She's a total partner together in ministry. She cares as much about this place as I do. She, she, she loves the Lord with all of her heart. She's a gift from God to me. If I ever wonder if God loves me or not, I just got to look across the room at Melanie. Amen. God loves to do good things for his children. Psalm 66 says, we went through the fire and the water, but you brought us to a place of abundance. To be blessed is to be in a harmonious relationship with the God. Not only wants to do good in us and through us, but, uh, uh, and, uh, or to, and, and to us, but he also wants to do good through us. He doesn't just bless you so that you can just hoard it. He wants to bless you so that in the overflow of that, you can be a blessing. I think that's the greatest joy in life, isn't it? Not, it, it it's the greatest joy not just to receive blessing, but the greatest joy is to go that next step and to be a blessing. That's what God said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, too, he says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I'm going to bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. He, he doesn't just say, Abraham. Uh, when I was in college, I had a Jewish guy on my floor that was an atheist. I said, why are you an atheist? He says, because I don't believe in a God that likes me more than he likes you, because, you know, we're, we're supposed to be God's chosen people. I said, wait a minute. God does not love you more than he loves me. I said, the reason that God chose you, the reason that God chose Abraham was not so that he could have a bunch of faves. The Bible said that he blessed Abraham so that all of the families of the earth would be blessed. That through Abraham, not just so he could have his favorite kids and all of the rest of us are, are some kind of second class, God did it. Because he wanted to bless, and through Jesus, that's exactly what he did, didn't he? He blessed the whole world through the seed of Abraham. Amen. God will bless you because he wants to bless you. Amen. Um, it's interesting. We we beat ourselves up. We 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 get this worm theology. We get this. Um, 
sense that God is mad at us, that we, we have this sense that God wants to do bad, or just looking for, for us to mess up, and we do mess up, but that he's looking for us to mess up so that he can say, see there, or, or, or to do some bad things to us. We get in, 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 overbalanced in this total depravity side. The clinical psychologist Jordan Peterson was reflecting on this. And, and, and he brought up a study that we treat our animals better than we do ourselves. Did you know that? Did you know that we are more apt to give our pets medical care than we are ourselves? And Jordan says it's because we just believe, why, why would we do anything for ourselves? Because we are these naked, ugly, ashamed, frightened, worthless, cowardly, resentful, defensive, and accusatory descendants of Adam. Why would we take care of ourselves? And, 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 and so he points out a study that says we, we, we do a better job taking care of our animals. And Jordan goes on to say, only you know the full range of your transgressions, insufficiencies, and inadequacies. No one is more familiar than you with all the ways your mind and your body are flawed. No one has more reason to hold you in contempt, to see you as pathetic, and by withholding something that might do you good, you can punish yourself for all your failings. A dog, a harmless, innocent, unselfish dog is clearly more deserving. That's how we, that's how we feel. So we, we take better care of our pets. Um, unless you're a pet of the Nordstrom family. That's one, one exception. We love our pets, but we kind of leave them up in God's hand. We didn't spend a lot of money. <laughs> we didn't spend a lot of money going to the vets with our pets. But you know, the scripture says that this thing inside of us that definitely needs healed, that desperately needs healed, the scripture says that God's big enough to handle it, that God loves you enough to do something about it. There were two dolphins in an aquarium in China that had fell deathly ill because of they had ingested plastic. And they made several attempts to remove the plastic surgically, but they failed. And in a last-ditch effort to save the dying dolphins, the veterinarians looked for help in an unusual place. There was a 7-foot, 9-inch herdsman from Inner Mongolia, the world's tallest man, Bao Shishun. Picture of him here. His arms are 41.7 inches long. Evidently the longest arms in the world. The veterinarians brought him to the aquarium, had him get in there with the dolphins, and had him reach his long arms in and pull the plastic out and saved both of those dolphins. Isaiah says, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short. However deep, however, however bad you think you are, God's arms are bigger. God's love is greater. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. God wants to bless everyone. I'm going to close with this story. I have a kind of a, I, I grew up Pentecostal. And if you know anything about the Pentecostal church, man, we are we get with it. And, um, you know, when you go to church in a Pentecostal church, you actually get aerobic, uh, you get aerobic credit for it. Your heart rate goes up high enough that you can actually count it as exercise for the day. And and we're really big on the, in, um, like, friendship with God, like God, we're, we're we being close to God. But there's, there's, there's actually a, an, another balance of that truth. God is not only intimate with us, he's also transcendent. So God is majestic. God is, there's something about the awe of God and that, that I kind of missed a little bit from my Pentecostal background. So I had a weird habit. I started when I was like in high school. Uh, my, even though my dad was the Pentecostal preacher, I knew that the Catholic Church was having a midnight mass 
at Christmas and I would sneak off to midnight mass. And I would go to midnight mass and I remember my first midnight mass, you know, everything was totally different than the Pentecostal church I was at. Everyone was quiet. I didn't know when to kneel, when to stand, all, all that stuff. Um, but I'll never forget a wonderful sermon. The, the, the pastor preached a message from a rough-hewn manger to a rough-hewn cross. I, I never forgot that sermon. And, and it fed something in my soul about the, maj- the, the majestic side of God, you know. So it wasn't like one was good and one was bad. It just filled in some of what I was missing. So I've kind of made that a tradition to, through the years, if I'm in a place, in a town where there's a midnight mass, I'll, I'll go to midnight mass. And this year my son-in-law, this one, not the other one, the, uh, um, Ben, said, hey, I'll go to midnight mass with you this year. I thought, great, great. But honestly, I'm, I'm going to be real honest about this. I wasn't sure I really wanted to go this year because we were having our own Christmas Eve service. And, and man, we had a wonderful Christmas. I, I'll be honest. When I got done with Christmas Eve service, I felt like we had celebrated Christmas so well at Life Church. I just went on my couch, and I was just ready to crash. But, you know, my son-in-law wanted to go with me, so I tanked up on some coffee. And and there's a thing about going to Mass that I, I'll just kind of be transparent and honest with you. I like it, but there's there's a part of the service that I kind of don't like, and that's the that's that's when you take the communion. And the reason I don't like it is because um, it's it's kind of exclusive. You, you you have to be part of the Catholic Church to take it. And I never kind of know what to do. Do I take communion? Do I don't? Because you're supposed to be Catholic if you're going to take communion, and if you're not, you're really sinning, you know, in their eyes. And I can't confirm or deny whether I ever have taken communion in in one of those in one of those churches, um, <coughs> um, Notre Dame, one Christmas. But I, Natalie and I went to a Natalie and I went to a. Uh, and by the way, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why I took it. Because you're supposed to be Catholic, and I am. Because Catholic means universal. It means that you're part of the church, right? I'm not Roman Catholic. I'm hillbilly Catholic, okay? <laughs> we don't drink wine. We have moonshine. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, 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 it, it's, it's a different kind of Catholic, you know? Um, but I remember going with Natalie one time, and, and there was kind of a... Like, like every church, you have, you know, nice priests and not so nice priests, good pastor. This priest kind of had a chip on his shoulder, and he was like, do not take communion if you've committed a venial sin, and skipping mass is a venial sin, so don't think you're going to come here on Christmas Eve and take communion if you haven't been coming to mass all the other times. And he said, and if you're not Catholic, we want you to stay in your seats and pray for the unity of the church. Well, what that means was we're supposed to pray that we all become Roman Catholic, you know. I knew what that meant. So I remember that one. And so I went with Ben, and I said, hey, well, Ben, what are we going to do about communion? And Ben's much more of a rule follower than I am. Ben's like, if they don't want us to take communion, we're not taking communion. I said, that's right, Ben, or we're not. I totally agree with you, buddy. <laughs> and... Uh, so we got we, we got there a half hour early, and they had this wonderful concert. If you've never been to the cathedral here in Knoxville, it's like crazy, amazing, brand new place. It's just beautiful. And so we heard the concert. It was really interesting because in Knoxville, there's Catholics from all over the world. So some of the women had like hair coverings because they were from like maybe Eastern Bloc countries where women cover their. But there were obviously like some charismatic Catholics. You know, they were just like. Worship, you know, hands in the air and all that during, uh, it was awesome. We were just having a great time. But they, but they have like this host of the service, and the host of the service got up and said right at the outset, I loved this. She said, if you're Catholic and you're not planning on taking communion today, or if you're from another faith that's not Catholic, she said, we have a tradition in our church that during the communion, we invite you to come to the front, put your hands over your heart like this, and receive a blessing. And Ben and I looked at each other like, we can do that. (laughs) So during the communion time, you know, Ben and I walked up there. I 
pastor did, you know, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. He, he did, the, he did, he blessed us. And I don't know about for Ben, I think Ben would say the same thing. It was one of the highlights of our Christmas season. It was just a, a beautiful moment of our Christmas season. Afterwards, I wanted to meet the, meet the bishop. I think I got a picture of me and the bishop, my new associate pastor right there. Uh, that's the bishop. I met him in the back, told him, I said, I'm from another church, just came to uh, worship with you. We had a great conversation. He's walking out the door, he just looked at me and said, stay close to Jesus. Stay close to Jesus. Yeah. I walked out of that service blessed. I told you that story because I just wanted to say that God wants to bless everybody. Did you notice when we took communion today, we said communion is open to all. He, he wants to bless no matter what you've done, no matter what sin you may have committed, no matter what your background, no matter how much you feel like you've fallen or you failed. It's the desire of our good God whose stance and his default over you is to bless you and to do good things to you. He wants to do good in you. He wants to good, do good to you. And he wants to do good through you. And it all starts by being in a harmonious relationship with God. Have you made peace with God? Have you made peace with God? Have you come to that point in your life where you said, God, here I am. I, I give you my heart. I give you my past. I give you my future. I know I've messed up. I know I've made mistakes, God, but I want to get back to Eden. I want your blessing on my life. I want to know that I'm ready for eternity, and I want to begin living that life even now so that you came that we might have life right now and live it to the full. I need that kind of blessing in my life. So with every head bowed and every eye closed today, I just invite you today, if you'd like to make your peace with God, would you just raise your hand in this building? God, yes, receive your blessing. You're here and you've already done that, but you just would say with me this morning that I want to experience God's blessing in me and to me and through me. Would you just raise your hands in this place? I need God's blessing in my life. Amen. So I just pray, Lord. I just pray a blessing over this congregation. And Lord, if I'm here today and for the first time I'm receiving you as my Savior, Lord, I just confess that I need you and I give you my heart. I give you my future. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I confess that you are the Lord of my life. I believe that you died and that you rose again for me. And I received your salvation. Your arm is not too short that you cannot save. And I received that salvation today. And I received that blessing. And all God's people said amen. Amen. If you made that start and you want to mark that today, I just encourage you to write that on a card and put that out there. We'll, we'll help talk to you about the next steps. Have you been baptized yet and just identified with Jesus and baptized and said in front of God and everybody that I'm a child of God. What a great way to start your year. Wouldn't it be to be baptized? Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing that song again. Caught up in your presence.